I want uh, to thank you uh, to come to the London Architecture Series tonight, which uh, with this word, I think you guys create a, have a great challenge with all the snow around the city. Uh, this, uh, this series is in partnership between the Museum of London, the LSA, which is the London Society of Architects, and the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario. Our uh, speaker for tonight is Michael Kinner. And Sandra Miller from the Conservancy is going to do the introduction. Please. Well, that was quick. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out on this wild and stormy night. Actually, I guess it's a lot better now than it was early this afternoon. Um, as Maurizio said, I'm Sandra Miller. I am the founder of Forest City Modern. And I'm also on the board of the Architectural Conservancy Ontario, the London Region branch. Uh, and so we partnered with the London Society of Architects for this particular series of talks. Very excited about this new collaboration. Um, also very excited to have Michael here tonight, uh, especially since I wasn't sure if he was going to make it, but thank God for Via Rail. Um, Michael, uh, Michael is a lawyer and now a filmmaker, or was a, was a lawyer, I guess. Um, he practiced law in Toronto until his retirement in 2011. Uh, he co-produced two documentary short films, Innocence on Ice, which uses black and white archival footage to portray the beauty of ice skating and Suko Pomodori, Pomodori? <laughs> a colorful depiction of making tomato sauce in the back lanes of Little Italy in downtown Toronto. So that's a very Canadian combination. <laughs> so both received support from Bravo Fact and the National Film Board of Canada. Uh, he also wrote and co-produced Skate to Survive, a one-hour documentary uh, on Omni TV, which has been broadcast on Omni and appeared in the Toronto Jewish Film Festival and the Ashkelon Film Festival, <laughs> pardon me, in Israel. Uh, it was also featured by Air Canada as an in-flight entertainment in the fall of 2009. So if any of you were flying, you might have caught it at the time. Uh, he recently completed Patron Saint, uh, which is a 70-minute feature documentary film about Janus Duska. Close. <laughs> Please refer to Michael's pronunciation, not mine. Uh, who is a psychiatrist, politician, and art patron. And that film had its premiere at the Real Artists Film Festival in Toronto in March of last year. Um, so almost exactly a year ago. And he's been working nonstop on the film we're going to see tonight uh, until, what was it, June? September. <laughs> September. Um, about the uh, creation and the design and the competition that came to um, realize the Toronto City Hall. Um, he has worked in the arts community as a lawyer and a volunteer and uh, has now translated his love of film into a second career. So here's Michael Kaner and he's going to talk about the film a bit and then we're going to watch the film and he'll also have um, time for questions afterwards. So thank you. Thank you. So, uh, you heard I did a little film called Patron Saint, which got screened at the Agnes Etherington Gallery at Queen's University in November to a raging torrent of thunderstorm, lightning, etc. Not only that, next door in the auditorium, I was in the art gallery next to the auditorium. Edward Snowden, you know Edward Snowden, you've heard of him? He was on Skype. So I'm very happy to see a crowd this side, believe me. <laughs> um, first, uh, thanks to the organizers, um, especially Sandra Miller and uh, Maurizio Bernal for asking to screen this um, film. There are not a lot of outlets for screening documentaries in Canada of any sort, frankly, and particularly ones that have a local theme, which this film uh, does, so I'm very grateful to be able to show it um, here. Um, the, the genesis of the film came from uh, my collaborator, who you will see in the film, uh, Karen Thiebel. She was the former archivist for the city of um, Toronto. Her original concept was to do a effectively biography of uh, Vilio Rivelle, who is the architect, of course, of New City Hall in Toronto. And, but after doing some research and discovering that there had never really been a proper documentary done about City Hall in about 50 years, I thought, 
the topic should be broader than just the history of Ravel the man, and so the film is the, uh, the history of the building, not the history of the, of the person. It also happened to be the 50th anniversary of the opening of City Hall, just around the time that Karen suggested this to me, and I thought, okay, that's a good excuse, it's a good way to raise funds, to say, yeah, yeah, there's a 50th anniversary, it gets people um, moving. So we started on the film about two and a half years ago and finished it in September uh, 2015, literally just in time for the screening on the actual anniversary date of the opening of the building and we screened it in the new City Hall Council Chamber, um, which is a very exciting event. Sandra was there, how she, that's how she knows about the film. And um, you'd agree it was an exciting event? Oh, it was great. Yeah, yeah. So having a film, having a film about the building in which the film is being shown, it's kind of a meta film, right? And um, so it was very good. Um, I don't want to talk about the contents of the um, of the film. That's for you to see and think about. Um, but a couple of disclaimers. You've heard already that I wasn't trained as a as a filmmaker, uh, nor am I trained as an architect, for that matter. Um, and shortly before I retired from practicing law, I, I kind of stumbled onto making documentary films. Sanders described a couple of them that I, that I uh, was involved with. Uh, and I've done two features. This is the second of the, um, of the two. So I feel I've got a little bit of experience, but there are, and I'm not trying to apologize in advance for any shortcomings, but there are technical deficiencies that I now start to recognize in my own um, work. So I have a discerning eye. And unfortunately, I'm now turning it on myself. Um, secondly, and as by way of a disclaimer, uh, this is not a comprehensive history of the building of New City Hall. That's what history books are for. It's a pretty wide sweeping history of New City Hall, but it doesn't have every fact and every figure in there, and that may disappoint some of you. Um, I probably dwell on some topics that one or more of you are gonna say, why is he doing that? And I've missed entire things that you think are incredibly important. So it's, it's idiosyncratic, perhaps a bit like myself. Uh, and I hope, you'll, I hope you'll accept it for, for what it is, which is an, an attempt to encapsulate a, a period of time into 70 minutes. And it's not an easy thing to, to do. I, I've been a keen observer of politics in Toronto since I moved there in the early 1970s. Um, I've always been interested in Toronto politics. I've been peripherally involved. I've worked on numerous uh, mayoralty uh, campaigns, and we have, I think, five mayors that are, inter former mayors that are interviewed in the, in the film. I worked on innumerable city council uh, campaigns. I was the chair of my local residents association for a number of years. I've sat on the board of directors of nonprofit corporations in the arts world and in the field of nonprofit housing and a variety of other things of a civic um, nature. And so when Karen suggested this topic of a, of a film about, originally about Ravel, which expanded into City Hall, it, it of course became second nature to me to, to just recognize that this was a great way to sort of in, to um, uh, synthesize a number of experiences that I'd had as, as a citizen of Toronto over the, uh, over the years. Think about, most of you are older. I won't look at anybody in particular when I say that. So some of you may even remember uh, what the world was like in the 1950s when this building was first being proposed. Louis Saint Laurent, who is he? Some people might say. Louis Saint Laurent was the Prime Minister of Canada. Dwight Eisenhower was the president of the United States, and those guys seem like they were a really long time ago. Toronto the Good, as it was known, um, had uh, separate entrances for men and women to go into a bar or a pub. You couldn't drink on Sundays uh, at all, and there were pockets in Toronto that were called dry where you couldn't drink alcohol at all. It was a very kind of backward parochial uh, place. And out of that, somehow, we got this incredible um, building. And if you think about it, not only do Dwight Eisenhower and Louis Saint Laurent seem like ancient figures, but two of the people in the film who you're going to see, some of you probably know who they are, uh, Eric Arthur 
and Nathan Phillips. Eric Arthur was born in 1898, and Nathan Phillips was born in 1892. And they were major players in the development of this building. They were really from the Victorian or Edwardian uh, era, and yet they participated in a building that I think is still modern and relevant uh, today. So it's remarkable that there's a hundred and 40 years spread between the birth of Nathan Phillips and today, and yet the ideas that he helped engender through this building, I think, are still with us. Um, the building is 50 years old, as you've heard, and it is still called New City Hall <laughs> to most people in Toronto. I don't even think about it as being odd anymore, but of course, when I start to put things down on paper, I think, why is it called New City Hall? Well, partly, of course, is because Old City Hall is still right there. There was a building built in 1899 that is the corner of Queen and Bay, just sort of kitty corner from, from, um, from New City uh, Hall. And so to distinguish old from new, we call this one New City Hall. But I think it's more than that. I think New City Hall still connotes um, kind of vitality and vibrancy that that building has after 50 uh, years. Um, Barbara Hall, who is one of the former mayors who's interviewed in the film, was a friend of mine. And, and I talked to her about what it was like to be in the mayor's office and to show people around City Hall. And she said 90% of people who came to Toronto who hadn't really known very much about the history or who weren't very old, thought that the building was no more than five or 10 years old, and she was the mayor only 15 years ago or so. So people still think of it as a new, modern uh, building, and maybe I'll just ask the question, is there anybody who's never seen the building live in the flesh? Everybody's been to Toronto? Oh, no, there's one person, excellent. Well, this will be a real treat for you in that case. <laughs> the rest of you, I'm not sure why you're here. You've already seen the building. Um, I didn't fully appreciate, until I started doing the research for this film, what a big deal this building was. Now, you know, it's in my interest to say that now that I've got a movie about it, but it also happens to be true. Um, there was an editorial in the uh, Royal Architectural Institute of Canada journal in October 1958, and those of you who are architects in the audience will be familiar with that journal. And the uh, editorial said this, quote, newspapers in Toronto have given space to city hall competition that they normally reserve for declarations of war or peace. From what we have seen, we cannot possibly exaggerate when we say that at no time and in no place in the world has the attention of two million people been drawn so vividly to the place of the architect and the importance of his services to society. So that was the RAIC journal thinking, Wow, we're onto something really uh, big here. The uh, Toronto Globe and Mail in October 1958 uh, had this to say about it. Toronto is already strewn with the wreckage of great plans and visions. It has had enough of subways and expressways that go nowhere, of fine avenues that end in railroad tracks. It is fed up with the gray mediocrity which results from too much politicking and too little action on the part of its elected representatives. Oh, this is 1958, does it sound familiar? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> this, city, this city has never come so close to actually creating something which will give pride and inspiration to its citizens and draw friends and admiration from the rest of the world as it now comes with Mr. Villio Revelle's design for its new city hall. This time, for the first time, and not the last time, let's go all the way. So Globe and Mail was a booster, the Toronto Star was a booster, the Toronto Telegram was a, uh, was a booster. At various times, the newspapers went back and forth on whether they supported it or they didn't support it. But one thing it was for sure is it was a good source of news. Right? There were stories, there were uh, letters. I see somebody nodding in the front. You may have read those papers at the time, ma'am. Yep. Uh, it was in the papers all the time. And reading the, uh, doing the research, I, I would read those newspapers and it was fascinating just to see how, how big a thing it, um, it was. Not everybody liked the building, of course. And uh, once again, from a newspaper of the time, this is October 1st, 1958, a Mr. Chambers at the, in the Toronto Globe and Mail, he said, the published pictures of the new city hall would go well on the cover of a 10th rate science fiction magazine. 
However, the blank walls of this man-made clamshell could be utilized as billboard space, thus setting a nice revenue for the city treasury. Such posters executed by the top craftsmen of the trade would add a touch of beauty to the coming eyesore. And that was not an unusual letter either. We had a big divide uh, between people who loved it and hated it, at least at the beginning, but within a pretty short period of time, as I reviewed the, the history, people started to come around and warm to the building, as, as I have done over the, um, over the years. As I said in the context of the newspapers, um, the one thing that is certain, whether you like the building or you don't like the building, is that it got people thinking about architecture and it got think people thinking about planning issues. And um, I'm not a native Torontonian, I'm from Saskatchewan originally. And one of the things that really surprised and impressed me about Toronto was how engaged the citizens, citizenry is in local political issues. They're very knowledgeable, very engaged downtown people like me, very active in, in uh, civic life. And I think it's not an exaggeration to say that New City Hall kind of kick-started that process. And, and you'll get glimpses of that when you see the, um, when you see the film. And I'm hoping that the film will sort of add to that ongoing discussion and, um, and debate. And last thought on this is that probably to me the most significant thing about this film is that it shows what a fantastic place Toronto has been. Um, it's, um, I've lived in a fair number of places, I've traveled quite a lot in the world, and Toronto has to be one of my favorite uh, places in the um, in the world and City Hall to me sort of epitomizes that Toronto was a place where anything was possible and in fact has has occurred so I'm going to stop there let you look at the film and uh, there's the Q&A um, afterwards and um, we'll talk again thanks well, I think it's a remarkable building I think it will be for Toronto what the Eiffel Tower is for Paris St. Paul's Cathedral in England and the Parthenon in Greece this building is known throughout the world. City Hall helped lead a reimagining of who we were as Torontonians and who we are today. And so from that perspective, it was an extremely important moment, and it's a very important building in public space. Toronto was rebranded in 1965 when the building opened. In a way, Toronto City Hall was a kind of Trojan horse that brought along with the architecture the eradication of wonderful structures. I uh, suggested that uh, we have an international architectural competition for the design. The competition turned out to be a huge deal. It was then, and maybe still is, the largest architectural competition that had ever been held, 510 entries to the competition from all around the world. When you saw all the, all the entries together, it, it did shine up, and it just like jumped off the page as, that's the winner. It was as if the City Hall was the most important thing that had ever happened in Toronto. Constant screaming and yelling, this is an outrage, why are we wasting this money? It's going to be ugly, it's going to be too expensive. To me, what was interesting about the council chamber is that it was a place where the politicians were surrounded by the people. The building serves as a focal point for the square, but the square is what made the complex the heart of the city of Toronto. The real strength of that big, empty, modernist space is that it's a vessel for all of these different things. It's interesting how soon after communities arrive in the city that they learn that that's the place to go. It dared to have a, a voice when there wasn't another building in, in the city that did. I never walk across the City Hall Square without looking at that building and being grateful that those judges chose that entry to win and that the city got behind it and built it. It was one of the nicer things that's happened to Toronto in my lifetime.
Philip Carter Johnson, who designed, uh, London architect, uh, designed our city hall and a number of other buildings in uh, London and southwestern Ontario, actually was one of the Canadians who submitted a bid for this competition. There were 70, I think 79 Canadians, somewhere in that, 70 something. Uh, Philip Carter Johnson was one of them. Um, and uh, I didn't know this actually, um, but uh, George Capellas, who wrote a book about City Hall, just came out last year around the same time, uh, contacted me and we had a great conversation about the interesting and bittersweet parallels between Velo Ravel's work on Toronto City Hall and Philip Carter Johnson's work on our City Hall here. Um, the, this competition was 1957. And of course, completed in '65. Uh, Philip Carter Johnson built our city hall starting in about the mid '60s, the whole Centennial Square complex, and then finished with City Hall in 1971. And in a very uh, sort of bittersweet parallel, also suffered uh, poor health as the city hall process continued, much for many of the same reasons that we suspect Velo's health declined. Um, and he uh, died two years after our city hall. Uh, was uh, opened and he retired. That was his last project and he retired and died several years later from a heart attack. And it was, uh, it was interesting talking with Michael McClelland and Dave LeBlanc from the Globe and Mail. Sort of, I didn't really know sort of all the details of Villa Ravel's health issues, but I thought, hmm, that's kind of a, a haunting parallel that they were involved in the same competition and suffered sort of the same fate. So. Be careful when you enter civic pol political competitions. <laughs> Buyer beware. Um, so Michael is available to answer questions and to converse with you about anything to do with this project and his, uh, his or anything else. film. Anything else? Yes. Law, architecture, travel, politics. <laughs> So I'll just repeat the question for those of you in the in the back. The, the question is, uh, was the interior um, Ravel's idea, and why didn't he didn't he work on it? Would that be the gist of the question? Yeah. Call me on Mike. Okay. Yeah. So the gist of the question is, uh, did, did Ravel have anything to do with the interiors, and if not, um, why not? The um, it, it's alluded to only in the in the film this issue about the interiors. Tula Ravel, one of his daughters, at one point says that he he could live with the fact that there were changes to the design of the building, but he really couldn't stomach the fact that he couldn't do the um, interiors. I, I you heard I was a lawyer, and I've actually read the contracts the, between the city and the architects, and there's no question that Ravel was not promised the the, the interiors as part of his contract, but it may have been implied, and, and um, I was in Europe a couple of years ago, and some of you architects, so you'll know this stuff, but, um, there's a, there was a concept in the early 20th century called Gesundkunstwerk, which was the idea that an architect designed the whole thing, that's what the word means. Um, so that means not just the exteriors, but the interior, and that means the rugs, the carpets in a residential premise. It could be in the cutlery, the, the plates, um, the furniture. So that is quite possible what Ravel had in, in mind when he got the job to do the building, that he was also going to do the, um, the interiors. And he was, he was quite bit bitterly disappointed. I've read stuff about all of that and uh, whether it contributed to his death, that might be you know, a bit of hyperbole, but, but nonetheless, he was, uh, he was disappointed. And the whole um, uh, business about how the, the, the furniture got built was a, another whole scandal. I couldn't even get into that because you know, the film's already 70 minutes long, but there was a, a faulty tender process. The winning bid didn't get the job initially. Um, uh, there was kind of signaling from the city about what they could afford. And when you're dealing with contract tenders, that's not how it's supposed to happen. So in any event, there's a whole other um, sort of minor scandal involved in that whole thing. 
And it certainly would have added to, to Ravel's general angst and stress, and, uh, and you, know, you heard that he, that he died. And just, just on that, um, uh, in other screenings, people have wondered, sometimes out loud, what would happen to poor Ravel. In fact, it was a heart attack. Somebody thought maybe he'd committed suicide because of the kind of ominous way. I didn't intend to imply that at all by the film, so just make it clear to everybody here that he, he died of well, natural causes. I mean, I think work-related stress causes, but nonetheless, um, uh, he, 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 it was a heart attack that, that eventually killed him. Does that answer your question? Okay. More? Baxter? Is it common uh, that the architect would attend a food country to oversee the construction of this project? Would it be common? Um, well, this was a major job. Um, Tula, that once again, his daughter says this was you know, the biggest thing that he had ever done, and it was a, the biggest thing he'd ever done by a factor of 10, I'm sure. There were some fairly large buildings in downtown Helsinki, but nothing like the City Hall um, competition. So the, um, the, the sequence was, and this doesn't come through all that clearly as I look at the film for the 487th time, I realize more defects. Ah. Um, the initial competition started in, in uh, 57. In April of 58, the uh, initial eight, or yeah, the, the, the finalists were selected. So there were eight finalists. And then in September of 58, Ravel was made the winner. Between 50, uh, April of 58 and September of 58, Ravel revised his original plans uh, for the building fairly significantly. He wins in 58. They then go to the process of doing working drawings, which took another couple of years to get done. Then they tender the contract, and Ravel had to be there for an awful lot of this stuff. He and Parkin were working together. There was a kind of uneasy partnership in that, uh, hinted at in the film. And, you know, in private conversations, people say it much more vehemently that, that they really didn't like each other, that they didn't get along. Maybe just dislike each other is the wrong way to describe it. But they certainly had a different approach to the practice of architecture. You, there was that big wheel that showed the organizational chart of the Parkin firm. Well, you know, he has, was running a business. It was a, an industry. Uh, and Ravel had this little tiny architectural uh, practice in, in Helsinki, and he was flying back and forth as many as 20 times a year, probably in a propeller plane for um, a lot of it. And, uh, and, but I don't think there was much choice. They didn't have fax machines. Right? A telephone call cost a lot of uh, money. You could send things airmail, but you know, by <laughs> it took a long time to get things, um, get things done. Um, something I just re was reminded of earlier, I was reading some stuff in preparation for, for today, and y you heard about the income tax problems at poor um, Ravel had. I should maybe elaborate on that uh, a little bit. Uh, this was in the late 50s, early 60s, and there was no tax treaty between Canada and Finland at the time. Now, tax treaties between countries mean that uh, one country recognizes that you're paying taxes in another, and so you get a credit in effect for the taxes you pay elsewhere. No tax treaty. And in those years, the, the marginal tax rate in Finland was like 75%, and in Canada, it would have been 65 or 70%. So Ravel would have been paying 70% of his uh, income in taxes in Finland because he was consider, considered to be a Finn. He kept his office there. And the Canadian government thought of him as a Canadian resident, and he was required to pay taxes on his income here. He was paying 130 or 40% 140% of his income in taxes. That's why he had to escape to the United States for six months to become a non-resident of both places so that he wasn't suffering from. And talk about stress. I mean, the furniture, maybe that pales in comparison to, um, to that. And one last thing, just, just to show off on how much I know about this stuff, and it comes, it comes up as I sort of start talking. In addition to the, um, this goes to your question, um, uh, in addition to the sort of tax, uh, income tax issues, there were actually duties on drawings that were brought into the country. And so they would have been taxed, I think it was at the 20% rate. So, and it was 20%, not at the, you know, the value of the paper, not 20% of, you know, $3 worth of, of uh, vellum. 
20% of the value of a working drawing, which would be tens of thousands of dollars. So I haven't heard it expressed elsewhere, but I've read it in history that one reason that they had to use a Canadian architect to partner with uh, Revell or whomever, uh, not just because of the licensing issues, which of course would have been the case, but they had to get around the, the problem of importing drawings from another country because they would have been a fortune in, um, in import uh, duties. Uh, no, I think all those things have been cured by globalization or tax treaties and other such things, but nonetheless. Answer your question? And, and a bit more, maybe. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. So the designer is from Finland designing for the fun of Canada. The climates are not all that different, but were the particular challenges, I, I think you remember something about wind being a problem in relation to this design. Yeah. Or am I wrong? Probably no, you are right. Are you old enough to remember this stuff? I, I do remember something afterwards. Uh, 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 okay, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, me but, too. <laughs> Once again, it's alluded to in the, in the, in the film. Um, those of you who are architects and engineers will, will know the process, but there are mathematical calculations for determining the stresses on buildings from, from wind. The problem with the Revell design is that it was so unusual that the, they couldn't use the mathematical models to assess the strength of the building in adverse um, conditions like wind. And uh, so they actually built a scale model of the building, which they put into a wind chamber at the University of uh, Toronto to measure the stresses. And there were significant modifications to the building as a result of those, those things. There was, as I mentioned earlier, the, <coughs> the, the tensions between Revell and Parkin, and I think they were probably ego-driven to a certain extent. I think uh, Parkin probably wanted to have his own hands on the design in some uh, way, but also the engineers were saying, wait a second, the way Revell designed this building, it's not going to work. And so they, they significantly modified it. The, the very first model, that, which was, I call it this, the 1957 model, was that white one with the very sharp knife fins. Well, if you look at City Hall today, it's quite different. Um, somebody else likened it to a, a square building that's just been bent, and I think that is a better way to think of it. The hyperbolic paraboloid that George Baird describes doesn't um, doesn't exist. It's not a it's not fat in the middle and skinny at the end. It's really kind of parallel. Uh, the, the front and back are parallel throughout the um, throughout the building. So uh, there was an issue about the uh, the wind. Uh, they corrected it by perhaps overbuilding uh, the building and and making it clunkier, as uh, as uh, George describes. There's another question just uh, at the back. Yes, yes sir. Um, I was really impressed on every perspective you could possibly think of commenting, commenting on the film was in the film, but I was wondering if there was anybody you approached and asked to interview and they turned you down. Uh, there was. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> um, I won't say who. I think it would be unfair to that individual, but I yes. You didn't find that you should. I just wonder if there was a perspective that you didn't get. Well, th th there's, I always answer the questions way longer than they should be, but let me start with this, which is that I'd hoped, for example, to go to Finland and interview a bunch of people there, including Yohani Palazma. Some of you may know who he is. He's a fairly well-known. Finnish architect, older guy. I mean, he would probably be in his late 70s, early 80s, and, and would have been a contemporary of Ravel's and know a lot of this history, and he's one of the world's experts on that period, and so he would have been a person I would have wanted. He was willing to be interviewed, but I just didn't have the money to do it. it uh, I won't bore you with how hard it was to get this movie made, but it, it starts with trying to raise enough money to do it, and flying to Finland with the with the film crew was going to just be you know too much for us to uh, to bear. Um, but the other there was another individual who um, knows an awful lot about City Hall, who had initially agreed to be interviewed, and for reasons that I still don't really understand, eventually uh, declined. And uh, so there was a person who I think would have added to the film, but. I like this movie as it is, so you know I don't think it was. I don't think I needed him. You know, to hell with him. <laughs> More questions? Yes. It's about the public square. Was that part of the design? When we were looking at the mock-ups, I didn't really notice the square part of the mock-ups on the competition. But his design, he has that long. The 
ramp. But then the inside of the square, what was in there, did he actually have plans for what was going in there? Yeah, no, Ravel's original design was for a, a totally empty square. Um, uh, Chris Palmer and Andrew Frontini, who were interviewed in the film, and I, I realize as I'm watching this that we identify them once and probably should have identified them a couple of times because people lose track of who they were. They are, they are the architects for the revitalization of Nathan uh, Phillips Square, and they have made efforts to kind of go back and get into Ravel's head about what he meant to do, intended to do back at the time. And um, it's, it's pretty clear from what I've read and, and, and uh, Ravel's initial plans that other than the skating rink with those uh, concrete arches over top, he pretty much wanted it to be empty. It was gonna be a big open uh, plaza. And um, over the years, the thing got junked up, right? Um, there were you know, park benches that were really horrible little things. Um, there was a peace garden, which I mean, who could say they were against a peace garden, but it wasn't part of the original vision, I don't think, for the square, and it eventually got, it's being moved out of the, the square uh, for that reason. Um, uh, there were things like a Zamboni parked, you know, with a little uh, chain link fence around it because they had to do something for the skating rink to clean it off, so that was there. So it was really, it was getting pretty horrible, and so uh, Chris and, um, and Andrew have done, a, I think, quite a nice job of balancing the attempt to go back to the original design vision for the square with the practical needs of today. They've, they've added a, a large uh, stage there. You could see it in some of the, uh, of the pictures. And that created a bit of a controversy because that clearly wasn't what was originally intended. But because the city hall square is now used for a lot of programs that wouldn't have been contemplated back then, it probably makes sense. And they've got a parking space for the Zamboni underneath it as well. So. <laughs> Uh, it, was a, it was a way to kind of, by adding one feature, it cleared away a lot of other junk at the same time. So, yes, sir. So, so who was responsible for the elevated walkways around the perimeter? Oh, it, it, that so, so, no, no, that was Ravel's um, idea. Again, it wasn't in the original model. It emerged. Uh, as, uh, there were really four versions, at least, four pretty complete yeah, the, the sharp point, pointy fins that I said, and then the, uh, as I understand it, and this is, it wasn't clear in any of the literature I could look at, but piecing things together, um, after the original eight were selected, the jury talked to those people about what they saw as the problems with their initial designs, and so they got modified between they're originally being selected as part of the eight to what they eventually produced, which, which resulted in Ravel's winning entry. So Ravel's original design was modified even before he won the competition, modified again because of, um, of the um, uh, engineering issues um, and cost, there were cost considerations as well along the way, which required that certain things get taken out. But that square was an early feature of, of Ravel's uh, design. How are we doing for time? More yeah, any more questions? Did um, they bring those daughters? Did they stay living in Canada? Yeah, uh, it, the, um, the whole family moved, in, it moved to Toronto in 1959. And um, uh, the, the, I got to know them a little bit through the, this process. And, and they said one of the things that their father was worried about in bringing them to Canada is that they were going to marry Canadians and so never go back home. Not that they didn't like Canadians, but you know, dads are protective of their children. And guess what? <laughs> Sonia married Mike Stewart, who is in the film. Uh, Tula uh, is an architect. Um, she studied at the University of uh, Toronto, so she was here as a high school student initially and then uh, went to, to the University of Toronto. Eventually uh, went back to, uh, to Finland, and there's a third daughter who, uh, who was the youngest, who I think was maybe only 15 or 16 when Ravel died and, and moved back to Finland with her, uh, with her mother. Um, she has subsequently become a translator, Finnish translator at the uh, United Nations. So they were all here. They all sort of think of themselves as you know, quasi-Canadians because they lived here for a considerable uh, period of, uh, of time. 
Anything else? No? Well, it's been great. Thanks for your attention. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, just a little reminder, our next lecture is on April 28th, so I hope we'll see you here. Have a good day. Thanks a lot.